Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our weekly explain session. The topic for today is going to be developed India by 2047. This particular topic has been making a lot of news lately. And in this session, we are going to discuss this topic in detail. We'll understand what do you mean by a developed country? How do you classify a nation as a developed nation? What is India's progress over the years? and whether India will be able to achieve this target of becoming a developed nation by 2047. But before we begin, we have a request. If you are benefiting from this initiative, do let us know by pressing the like button, share your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's start by talking about developed India, the goal of making India a developed nation by 2047. But first, why is this topic in news? What's the context? See, recently, on the 15th of August, India marked its 76th Independence Day. We marked 75 years of independence and the government of India had planned a grand initiative to mark this event, this historic event, that is Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. Throughout the year, a number of initiatives have been organized by the government to mark the 75th anniversary of India's independence. So during this day's Independence Day celebrations, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who unfurled the national flag at the Red Fort, he gave a call for the nation. He called upon the country to adopt the Panch Pran or the five vows or the five resolutions. And one of the primary resolution that Prime Minister spoke about was to make the country a developed nation in the next 25 years. That is by 2047, when India would be marking its 100th anniversary of independence. The Prime Minister laid out a vision that our country should become a developed nation by then so that we will fulfill the, the vision, the dreams of our founding fathers and the freedom fighters who sacrificed their lives, who sacrificed themselves for the sake of our independence. It's in this context that the topic becomes very important. The Prime Minister, he gave a call for all the citizens and the government itself to adopt these five vows or five resolutions. This included the first resolution of making our country a developed nation by 2047. The other four resolutions refer to removing any trace of colonial mindset, that is getting rid of any colonial hangover or colonial heritage, which has hampered Indian thinking and Indian thought. Then he called upon Indians to take pride in their heritage, in our cultural roots, in our tradition. He called upon the country to remain united, to strengthen our unity, despite the diversity we have, to celebrate the diversity and to build unity in the nation. And the final resolution that the Prime Minister spoke about was for the citizens to, concul to inculcate a sense of duty, a sense of duty towards the nation, towards the society. These were the five vows that the PM talked about during the Independence Day celebrations. And the first resolution was to make our country a developed nation in the next 25 years. So this brings us to the topic, developed India by 2047. The question is, what is a developed country? How do you classify a country as a developed nation? On what basis are countries categorized as developed countries, developing nations, underdeveloped nations? So that is a very important concept that we need to understand. Then we have to evaluate what is India's status? Where do we stand today? And what is the way forward if we are to achieve this ambitious goal? This call given by the PM in many ways is a reminder of a similar call that was given back in uh, the 1990s by former President APJ Abdul Kalam. Right? He laid out the India 2020 vision and he had called upon the Indian government and the Indian citizens to work towards this vision, towards this goal, to make India a developed country by 2020. Even though India has not become a developed nation as of now, it has definitely achieved a lot of progress over the years. Be it our socio-economic performance, be it our achievements in science and technology, be it India's diplomatic profile, its military strength. In every domain, India has seen tremendous growth over the last few decades especially in the last 30 to 40 years. So now the question is, where does India stand as of today? Right? Where are we headed? And what are the challenges that lie ahead for India 
to achieve this goal of becoming a developed nation by 2047. So first let's understand how countries are classified as developed countries. On what basis is a nation categorized as a developed country? See, of course, the best reference here is to look at the definitions and categorizations brought out by various global institutions, be it the United Nations or World Bank, the World Economic Forum, etc. Right? They all have certain parameters based on which they categorize countries into different categories. But every organization, they have their own methods, they have their own process through which they categorize countries into developed and developing nations. For example, if you look at the United Nations, right, the UN has something called the World Economic Situation and Prospects. This is an assessment, it's a periodic assessment that's brought out by the UN regarding the economic status of the world and the prospects of the world where the performance of every country is rated and countries are categorized into different groups. According to the UN, countries are placed into three different categories, three broad categories based on the level of their economic performance and socio-economic performance. So countries are classified by the UN into developed nations or developed economies, which is usually your Western countries. Next, the second category is economies in transition, which refers to a set of industrialized nations. And then you have the third category, the developing economies, the developing nations. This is how the UN categorizes countries into different groups. But on what basis is this categorization done? That's a big question. That is something that you need to understand uh, with regard to both prelims and mains. See, this assessment of the UN is based on certain parameters that has been developed by the World Bank. World Bank has developed a categorization method which is used by the UN as well. Here the basis for determination is the per capita national income, the per capita GNI or the gross national in income of a country. This is used as a primary basis to group countries into the developed category and the developing category. So drawing on this methodology of the World Bank, UN has created its own categorization and it has divided the countries into three categories that we just discussed. So based on the per capita GNI of a country, the World Bank has placed countries into these four categories you are seeing over here. Right? High income countries, upper middle income countries, lower middle income countries and low income countries. By drawing on this methodology, by using GNI, per capita GNI as a parameter, the UN has developed its own different methodology through which it is categorizing countries into three categories. So as you can see, different organizations have different methods, different ways in which they are treating and categorizing countries. For example, if you look at the, the World Bank's method of using GNI uh, on a per capita basis, the high income countries include your Western countries led by Norway. Norway is considered to be the most developed nation as it registers the highest per capita national income. This is followed by US, the United Kingdom and the others. Is that clear? Next you have your upper middle income countries includes China, Brazil, South Africa and the others. These are also referred to as emerging economies by few other institutions and by few experts. Then you come across the lower middle income countries that includes India as well along with its South Asian neighbors like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Then finally you have your low income countries which are the most underdeveloped nations and the small island countries as well. It mainly includes African nations, backward African states like Somalia, Zambia and the others. It also has war torn countries like Afghanistan, Yemen and the rest. So this is how the World Bank has categorized but UN has a different categorization. So now that we were talking about UN's methodology and now that we were discussing how UN places countries into those three categories that is developed economies in transition and developing countries. It's important to note that this method of UN has been often questioned. It's all the method of UN has often been criticized. It has been contested because of certain flaws, certain anomalies that exist in the methodology of the UN. 
So basically what I'm trying to say is that there is no one fixed way of determining whether a country is a developed country or not. But definitely there are certain parameters on the basis of which you can determine whether a country has achieved the developed status. So that is the focus of this discussion. We'll talk about the controversy surrounding UN's classification, why UN's methodology is not entirely correct, what are the flaws in UN's approach and then we go, we'll go on to discuss the right parameters for judging the performance of a nation, especially the socio-economic performance of a nation. See, if you look at UN's classification, right, like I said, it has drawn on World Bank's parameters. But according to World Bank, there are only three countries which actually fall under the developed category. Based on per capita gross national income, only Norway, US and UK truly uh, they qualify to be listed as developed nations. This is according to World Bank. But according to UN, there are 31 developed countries. Because UN has adopted a slightly different model by drawing upon the World Bank's methodology. So there in itself lies a contradiction. There are 17 countries listed by UN as economies in transition. These are mainly industrialized nations. And all the other countries, the rest, They've all been listed by the UN as developing countries. It includes your underdeveloped nations as well. So majority of the nations are listed by the UN under the developing category with around 31 of them under developed category and 17 of them under economies in transition. Now the flaw here is that the problem here is that a country like China, which today has emerged as a global power, which is challenging the superpower status of the UN uh, of the United States, such a country has been listed as a developing nation. As you all know, the global economy is heavily dependent on China, on China's supply chains, its manufacturing strength. Right? China has already emerged as a global power and today it is challenging the US, the United States, for its superpower status. So such a country, such a powerful nation has been listed as a developing nation by the UN, even though its per capita national income is many, many times higher than other developing and underdeveloped nations. This is a, a critical flaw in the UN's method. For example, if you compare China's uh, per capita income with, let's say, Somalia, which was on the last rank, right? In the earlier chart I showed you, Norway was the most developed country, according to World Bank's classification, and Somalia was the least developed uh, country, right? If you compare Somalia's per capita income with China, it is 26 times higher. But yet, China is also categorized as a developing nation by the UN. Now, why is this a problem? It's a problem because countries which are classified as developing nations, they get to enjoy a lot of benefits with regard to the global trade framework. They'll get to enjoy a lot of subsidies. They'll get to enjoy a lot of uh, benefits with regard to the foreign trade policies. Right? In fact, recently, just a few years back, former US President Donald Trump, he had criticized UN's method methodology of classifying nations. And he had said that if China is a developing nation according to UN, then even US should be classified as a developing country. The point is, UN's methodology is not absolutely perfect. It is contested. There are flaws in it. If you compare China's per capita income with Norway, the most developed nation according to World Bank, right? The difference is just about seven times. Whereas China's per capita income, which is 26 times higher than Somalia's, both have been placed under the category of developing underdeveloped nations. So because of this anomaly, because of this flaw that exists, the methodology of UN has often been criticized. This is not the gold standard to measure the progress of a country. There are other problems as well. There are other shortcomings. For example, take a look at countries like Ukraine. Ukraine has been listed as an economy in transition because it became an industrialized nation as it was part of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Right? Ukraine did witness a lot of industrial growth. So based on certain parameters, UN has classified Ukraine as an economy in transition. But if you compare its GNI, per capita GNI with China, there is a huge difference. Ukraine's GNI per capita national income is just a third, one third of China's. And yet, 
Ukraine is ranked higher as an economy in transition than China. This allows China to enjoy a lot of benefits with regard to foreign trade, whereas those benefits get denied for Ukraine. So these are some critical flaws that exist with regard to the way in which countries are categorized by global organizations. So the bottom line is that there is no set way of defining whether a country is actually a developed nation or a developing nation. Yes, there are different methodologies, different indices that are used, but you can't just use one parameter like national income to determine the progress and the status of a country. So it's important in this context to understand where does India stand and what parameters should we be using to measure the developmental status of a country. What's the best way of analyzing it? How do you figure out the developmental status of a nation? See, India as of now is definitely way behind the curve. If you compare India with the developed nations, the 31 developed nations according to UN, right? If you compare India with them, without a doubt, India is way behind the curve. If you look at, let's say, US or Canada or Japan, more importantly, if you look at West European countries, and if you compare India with them, India is definitely miles behind them. Even if you compare India with China, on all parameters, India lags behind China as well. Right? And it's this is not the only problem. If you compare India with other developing countries, other em emerging economies as well, like Brazil or South Africa, or even our small neighbors like Bangladesh, India is ranked even behind them as well. So India does have a lot of challenges when it comes to its socio-economic status. Yes, we have grown as a country, we have registered tremendous growth. India happens to be one of the fastest growing economies today, right? It has considerable national power. It has emerged as a, as a global power as well today, right? But yet, India is riddled with several challenges, socio-economic challenges. If you look, just look at India's, let's say, a metric like GDP, or if you look at standard metrics like purchasing power parity, PPP, if you compare India on these terms with other countries, India gets listed as one of the largest economies in the world. Right? I'm sure all of us would have read that India is the third largest economy. It's all set to become the third largest economy in PPP terms. Right? Right behind uh, US and China, India is expected to become the third largest economy very soon. Right? Our GDP growth is, has been quite phenomenal over the years. Despite all the crisis situations, despite the pandemic, despite the Russia-Ukraine war, India has registered decent growth, its economy has shown resilience, and it has been able to sustain one of the highest levels of GDP growth in the world. But this alone doesn't define whether a country is a developed nation. Measuring performance just on the metrics of GDP or PPP terms, right, or even just on per capita income, will not help you determine whether a country has become a developed nation, right? So what are the other parameters? What are the best parameters to gauge a country's status? So many experts, they argue that there are two, po two, two pointers or two parameters that one should rely on while determining the developmental status of a nation. Because this gives a more accurate picture, not just about the country's economic performance, but also about the country's social performance. It will help you understand how the country is doing on its social parameters. So the two indicators are, one is your HDI index, the Human Development Index, which gives a very good idea about the social performance of the country, the performance of a nation on the basis of its social parameters. And second is GNI per capita, which is a good gauge of economic performance of the nation. These two parameters are considered to be the, the best ways in which you can determine the developmental status of a country. Now, if you look at both the graphs given over here, right, be it the HDI graph or the GNI per capita graph, in both of them, India is clearly falling behind, right? India is way behind the curve when compared to other countries like China, and even the developed nations like US, UK or Norway. So clearly, India has a lot of catching up to do, without a doubt. Right? Because on both the terms, India is way behind the curve. Look at India's per capita income here, the green line. Right? It's way behind 
the income status of China and the other developed nations. Even our HDI parameters happen to be behind these countries. But this doesn't mean that India hasn't seen any progress. Yes, there are certain grave indicators as well. For example, like I said, if you just take per capita income as a basis, India falls behind even Bangladesh. We even fall behind Brazil, even South Africa, right? Even if you take few HDI parameters, countries like Bangladesh have often outperformed India on certain indicators. But still, India on its own has achieved a lot. India has made considerable progress in the economic domain and in the social domain as well. And India is headed towards the path, towards the right path, where it can make further course corrections, take more ambitious initiatives to put the country on the right path by 2047. So the understanding is that, yes, there are very serious economic and social challenges in our country, right? But at the same time, India does have the hope, it does present the hope, it does register very, very significant performance over the last three decades, which makes India a right candidate to become a developed nation probably in the next few decades. May not be in the next 25 years, but definitely in the next few decades. Now, for example, if you compare India's per capita income with that of China, which we saw earlier in the graph, you will notice a huge divide over here. China's per capita income on GNI basis is 5.5 times that of India. If you look at other countries like UK, right, which is a developed nation, its GNI per capita is 33 times more than India's. So the gap is very significant. This is something we have to be conscious of, right? This is where you have to be realistic of India's current status and where India actually stands as of now. No doubt India is a fast growing nation. It's a fast developing nation. But we still have a lot of catching up to do when we compare ourselves with the large economies and the developed nations. The disparities are very evident in our country. Right? You look at the standard of living in India in several rural areas, remote areas, even in certain pockets of urban India. Right? There is extreme poverty. There is difficulty in accessing even basic essential services like education, food, shelter. So there is one side of India which is fast growing, which is making rapid advances in every domain, including in science and technology. But there is the other face of India, the rural and uh, few urban pockets, which paints a completely different story altogether. So this disparity, this social and income divide in our country is going to be a very, very big challenge, a serious challenge for India, a serious roadblock for India to achieve this ambitious target. So we're going to understand a little more about India's road ahead, India's performance on some of these indicators, and we'll specifically talk about the HDI index. Now you have a fair idea about India's performance with regard to per capita national income. We know where we stand. There is definitely a lot of progress India has seen over the years. Our per capita national income has definitely gone up, especially since we introduced the LPG reforms of 1991. Since India liberalized, privatized and globalized its economy, there has been a massive economic boom in the last 30 odd years. There has been very fast industrial growth. A lot of scientific advances have happened. The private sector has boomed. Our foreign trade has gone up, right? Millions of jobs have been created. Definitely standard of living in general has gone up for India's population. There's no doubt on that account. But as we saw, when we compare India with the large countries, developed nations on income basis, on per capita national income basis, we are way behind here on this parameter. But if you look at the other parameter which we were talking about, that is HDI index, this is where there is greater hope for India because India has achieved some incredible achievements in the last 30 years. See the HDI index, the Human Development Index, which measures human progress, human development and societal development, it is brought out by the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. This index, index itself was conceived by a very popular Pakistani economist, Mehboob ul -Haq. 
So this index was later modified by the UNDP and it regularly comes out with the human development report every year indicating the status of human development around the world in every country. This HDI index is basically a composite index that, that is based on different parameters. There are three specific parameters here measured by UNDP because Mehboob Ulhaq who devised the index, he believed that based on economic data, based on scientific evidence, he believed that these three parameters listed here, they provide the right picture about the developmental status of a country. If you're looking to gauge or measure the socio-economic performance of a nation, according to Mehboob Ulhaq and according to UNDP, these are the best parameters to measure. It will give you the extent of human development that's happening in a region, in a particular country. These parameters include life expectancy. That's the first parameter. Because when you measure life expectancy in a region or in a country, it will give you an idea about the status of public health care in that nation. Countries which have a strong public health care system, right? Or in general, if they have a strong health care system backed by the private health care industry as well, the citizens will enjoy better health. They will see longevity in their lives. Life expectancy goes up considerably because of advances in medical care. Because of better, better medical care, because of better health care facilities, life expectancy goes up. So this is a great measure of the socio-economic progress of a particular region or a particular country. Second parameter measured here is education, performance of a country on the basis of its educational uh, progress. So here UNDP's index measures mean years of schooling and expected years of schooling. These sub-parameters helps determine the education levels in the country, how the country will be training, educating its manpower, how the country's human resource will evolve because this will determine the future course of its economy. It will determine the kind of jobs that will be created, the kind of innovation that will happen in the country. So this is another key parameter measured as part of the HDI index. And then the last one is per capita income, right? Per capita income that we were discussing about, it is definitely a measure of standard of living. The income in the hands of the people, what they are earning, right, on a per capita basis. It will determine what facilities they can access, what services they can access, what kind of food, what quality of food they can access, how nutritious is the food they are accessing, what quality of healthcare can they access, right, what is the quality of their housing. So all these basic measures of standard of living can be understood by looking at per capita income status. So by relying on these three parameters, the HDI index was devised by economist Mehboob Ulhaq, which has today been transformed into the HDI index by the UNDP. So this is considered to be one of the best measures to evaluate social progress along with economic progress. Because blindly achieving economic progress without social progress will take you nowhere. In fact, this is one of the criticisms against globalization, against India's LPG reforms. Many critics argue that even though India has registered tremendous economic growth in the last 30 years, this growth has not been equitable or inclusive. They say that the upper classes, the rich, the industries, they have largely cornered the benefits of development. Yes, middle, the middle class population has surged, but the lower classes, the sections of the country which is under extreme poverty, they have been left behind according to the critics. So for a country to truly become a developed nation and to improve its performance on all the parameters, education, healthcare, food, etc., you need social progress along with economic progress. Economic progress alone is not the true measure. Right? So, on the social front, India has definitely made a very significant improvement on its HDI metrics. If you compare India's uh, figures, let's say from 1970s or 1960s, and if you compare this with data from 1990s and present day, right, you will see a tremendous transformation that India has seen. Life expectancy in India has gone up. Today it is around 70 years. Whereas 
during independence back in 1947, life expectancy in our country was as low as 40 years. Why? Because healthcare system was very weak in our nation. Even basic food and nutrition, sanitation was, was largely missing. The government was not able to deliver basic services. So as a result, life expectancy was very low because people were succumbing to various diseases uh, and various other uh, health conditions. But today with improved healthcare and overall economic and social progress, life expectancy has gone up. It has surged and along with it, our HDI performance has improved as well. We have shown tremendous progress in the field of education as well. Right? In the last 30-40 years, at all levels, at the school level, at college, higher education, right? Across all the levels of education, there has been tremendous progress that India has seen. The literacy rates have gone up. The gender divide in education has come down drastically. So this shows that India is definitely on the right path. Over the last 30 years, India has definitely achieved a lot of progress in the social domain along with its rapid economic progress. There is no doubt about it. Yes, there might be shortcomings. Yes, there are a lot of sections left behind. The growth we have seen may not be entirely equitable or inclusive. The divide might have increased, the social income divide. But at the same time, there are success stories as well. For example, the World Bank had brought out a report in 2018 on the socio-economic status of India. And I want you to take a look at this observation made by the World Bank. In this report, the World Bank had stated that even though India is the world's third largest economy in terms of PPP or purchasing power parity, most Indians, majority of Indians are still relatively poor compared to people in other middle income countries or rich countries. It basically shows the huge divide and the high poverty levels in India that has persisted when you compare India with other nations, with other middle income nations and with other developed nations. So this is the dichotomy that we are witnessing. On one hand, right, India has definitely shown a lot of progress, a lot of improvement, but at the same time, there is still a lot to achieve. Because the right measure of comparison here, the right uh, comparison we should be making is with the large countries, the fast developing countries like China, the developed nations of the West, Right? That would be a right comparison for India. So when we compare ourselves with various developed nations, middle income nations, that is when we realize the, the entire gravity of the problem, the challenges that lie ahead. Because on all these parameters, education, healthcare, income, right, and every other socio-economic parameter, we are still way behind the curve. Right? So there's still a lot of catching up to do for India. According to this World Bank report of 2018, it was just around 10% of India's population which could have consumption levels above $10 per day. Only around 10% of Indians, roughly let's say around 14 crore people in the country out of our uh, 1.4 billion population could afford to spend more than $10 per day. The rest, the 90%, the other 90%, their consumption level, their daily expenditure was less than $10 a day. Now this again shows the huge income divide, the disparity that lies between India and the actual developed countries. Right? This doesn't even match up with the status of middle class in the, in the other countries. So even India's upper classes, even the upper middle class wouldn't compare with the middle classes, the lower middle classes of other developed nations. Right? Because the consumption levels, the expenditure uh, capabilities are very low. And even this money which is spent on a daily basis, most of it is still going towards basic essentials like food, shelter, education, etc. So a large section of India's population may be able to afford it. Around 10% of India's population may be able to afford it. The number is still quite huge. But what about the rest? Right? The number of people in India with extreme poverty stands somewhere at around 218 million. According to our latest report, more than 20 crore people in India are suffering from extreme poverty. I'm talking about extreme poverty levels, where it is difficult for them even to source a single me a meal per day, where it is difficult for these people to even have a, a roof over their heads, right? 
So if you look at the general poverty levels in the country, lot of commissions, lot of reports have indicated that our poverty levels are anywhere between 30 to 50 percent. So this obviously directly affects the standard of living in the nation. It affects access to services, right? So the true measure of a country's status, socio-economic status, its economic performance, or social performance, is not just on the basis of its economic metrics, just GDP growth or measuring and comparing ourselves on PPP terms or on per capita basis, that alone will not give us the true picture, right? For a country to be known as a developed nation or, as, or even as a fast developing nation, there are other parameters which also come into play, right? The overall social development in the country, the various divides in the society, religious communal divides, regional divides, linguistic divides, right? The class-based divide, which has been further aggravated by the caste system, the atrocities of the caste system. So all these are dragging India back, whereas the other side of India is making a lot of progress and achievements. So India is caught somewhere in between. And to make that leap towards 2047, to make that leap from a developing nation, which is witnessing a dichotomy in its growth, towards truly becoming a developed nation, we still have a long way to go. But definitely, it's not an impossible dream. It's not unachievable. right? Because India has shown tremendous progress in the last 30 years. If India continues on the right path, if we have strong democratic institutions, right? if we have considerable diplomatic military reach and continue making advances in science and technology, in innovation, research and development, along with addressing the governance issues and social issues we have, that will provide for all-round development. It is this all-round development that our country needs to head towards the path of a developed nation. right? As your economic profile grows, your diplomatic influence should also grow. right? Our diplomatic principles, our philosophies, which are, uh, which are dependent on our developmental challenges, Right? There should be a complete change over here. There should be an overhaul of India's diplomatic outlook. As an underdeveloped country, as a developing nation, our worldview was different. Back in 1950s, India's worldview was different. In 1990s, our diplomatic outlook was different. So we need to move ahead and think more on a, on a global scale, even in our diplomacy, even with regard to our military reach, because all of this represents your national power, right? It's a combination of all these factors which will push India towards becoming a developed state. Is that clear? So now the question is, the big question, how can India achieve this? What's the way forward? What's the path India can take? How do we compare ourselves? How do we measure ourselves? And uh, what steps do we need to take to ensure that we are on the right path, right? So. By 2047, if we were to achieve the status of a developed nation, or at least if you were to head on the right path, there are a lot of steps that India need to take. And it begins with by taking a realistic outlook about our current status. You can't over exaggerate your current performance, right? You need to recognize the positive achievements. At the same time, you have to recognize the ground realities. The ground realities with regard to poverty, with regard to lack of basic essentials, that is something that needs to be acknowledged because that gives you an objective idea about where our country stands as of today. So one way for India to start is by measuring and comparing ourselves with other countries. Where does India stand today when we compare ourselves with, let's say, China? Where does India stand today when we compare ourselves with the developed Western countries? Now that we know the parameters like HDI and uh, per capita income, these are the best parameters to measure. So on the basis of these parameters, when we compare India with the rest, where do we stand? Right? For, for example, if you look at India's current per capita income as of today, and if you compare this with the per capita income of China, China had achieved this status. That is, it had already reached the current per capita income of India back in 2007 itself, almost 15 years back. 
So what does this tell you? It tells us that in terms of per capita income, per capita national income, China is 15 years ahead of India. At least, at least on paper, theoretically speaking, China is at least 15 years ahead of India in terms of per capita national income. So that is the catching up we have to do, right? So what growth China saw in the last 15 years is something that India will have to replicate. And if we are able to match those growth levels of China in the last 15 years, then we will get to a stage where we would be on par with China's per capita national income as of today, right? Only then we'll be able to bridge that, that gap that exists. Now, if you compare this with the developed Western countries, we are many, many decades behind the developed nations, right? C developed countries like, let's say, US, UK, Norway, they had achieved India's current per capita national income back in 1980s, 1970s. So compared to them, we are a good 40 to 50 years behind the curve. So if you're using time as a reference here and comparing the uh, countries on this basis, we can say that we are at least 15 years behind China in terms of national income. And we are at least 40 to 50 years, four to five decades behind the developed Western countries. If you just take HDI into account, let's say you keep per capita national income aside because that is not the only measure, right? Economic performance is not the only measure. If you want to take social performance and draw a comparison here, our current HDI score is around 0.64, right? According to UNDP. China, for example, had already achieved this HDI level many, many years back, back in 2004. So how many years are we behind China? Almost 18 years, almost two decades behind China. Now you compare India's current HDI with developed countries. They had achieved these levels back in 1980. UK, for example, had a HDI of around 0.64 in 1980. So we are 42 years behind countries like UK. So that is the, the gap, the divide we are talking about. Now I'm stressing on, on these points, the measurement, the comparison, because this is what helps you get a realistic picture of where India stands. Without understanding this, how will you chart a course towards achieving your ambition, your goal in 2047, right? To be able to achieve the target, at least to get close to it. Even if you don't achieve it, even to get closer to it would be a great, great achievement. But to even get close to the target, we need a realistic assessment. We should understand where exactly we stand. We shouldn't over glorify our failure. At the same time, we shouldn't over exaggerate our success and achievements. You need a realistic assessment here because despite the tremendous economic growth and progress, despite all the achievements we have seen, right? Our scientific institutions have shown tremendous progress. Our private industry has shown a lot of progress. Our diplomatic growth, our diplomatic influence has gone up. Our military reach has increased, no doubt. But the reality is that we still have 218 million people living in extreme poverty every day. This makes India the home to the world's largest number of poor people in the country. You, you can't ignore that other reality of India, the other side of India, right? So to identify the right path, to chart the right course towards this ambitious target, we need to look at an observation that the World Bank had made in the 2018 report that we were talking about earlier. In that report, the World Bank highlighted the problems that India is facing, but it also had a positive point. The World Bank had stated, based on its assessment of historical data, it had stated that by 2047, that is when India would be marking its 100th anniversary of independence, by then, at least half our population at least 50% of our population, they would have achieved the status of middle class. That is in itself is a significant achievement for India. See, currently our population is around 1.4 billion, which makes us the second most populous country. Very soon, according to again a UN report, right, the UN population report, we will become the most populous nation in the world by overtaking China. If you're talking about the year 2047, India's population would somewhere stand around 1.6 to 1.7 billion, right? We would clearly be the most populous country in the world. So out of this gigantic population, if you are able to push 50% of our population into the middle class category, 
that is a tremendous achievement that is around 800 million people 800 million plus would enter the middle class bracket right so india has that potential india is on path towards achieving that and it means the standard of living in our country is going to improve on the current path with better governance with better initiatives india is going to achieve the status we are going to get there at least push half our population into the middle class category where they will enjoy a much better standard of living some, uh, which is something you often see in the developed uh, western countries which means people will have better access to basic services they'll have better access to quality food and nutrition better sanitation they'll they'll have access to a much cleaner environment right because we're also focusing a lot on climate action on environmental issues as well so people will have better jobs, better health care, cleaner water to drink, better access to basic services that the government is supposed to provide. Right? So this is a positive sign. But of course, this comes with conditions. In the same report, the World Bank had pointed out certain preconditions that there would be certain challenges. And if India were to achieve this, we need to overcome them. We need to ensure that we go beyond these roadblocks. We need to solve the challenges that lie ahead in order to fulfill this ambition. For example, public service delivery in our country has been a big problem, right? A very problematic area. This deals with public administration. It deals with our governance mechanisms. Even though India has a lot of welfare programs, right? There is a lot of leakage in government programs. There is excessive corruption in the government. So the intended beneficiaries are not receiving the actual benefits of growth and development. It's being eaten away in the middle. Public service delivery has been ineffective. So addressing this would be a, a key challenge for India. And you can't pull people out of poverty, push them into the middle class that on such a scale without addressing your governance related issues, without addressing the issues related to basic service delivery and administration, right? So this is where I would like to point out a few areas that India has to focus on if we were to get closer to the target by 2047, right? See, definitely India has the potential. We may not fall technically under the category of a developed nation according to UN or according to World Bank. Like I said, those methodologies have their own flaws, but still, even getting closer to this dream, even pushing 50% of our population uh, into the middle class category, right? That itself would be tremendous progress. But to get there, we need to focus on certain priority areas like we have to improve our governance. We have to focus on public administration, improve service delivery in the country. And India cannot do this without a strong democratic state. Correct? This is where we have to address the, the current tensions, the current divides and issues that you find in our society. The country has to go beyond, it, it has to go beyond divides like communal divides. It has to go beyond the class divide. It has to go beyond the linguistic regionalistic divide. We will need democratic institutions, right? Any authoritarian tendency has to be avoided. As long as India remains a strong democracy, a functional liberal democracy and a secular state, that would push India on the right path to focus on key areas of governance and administration. Your political institutions, right? The executive, the judiciary, the legislature, they have a critical role to play here, right? The government would, will have to come out with effective, far-reaching socio-economic welfare programs. It has to provide much better services with regard to education, health care, food, etc. Right? The parliament, the legislatures, including the states, they will have to come out with the right laws, the right legal framework. The judiciary will have to uphold the rights of the people. Look at the constitutionality of laws. Right? Keep the executive under check. Correct any mistakes made by the legislature. So strong democratic institutions are critical to ensure that we can stay on the right path of governance. So the focus of our government remains on governance related, administrative related uh, initiatives 
through which we can improve the effectiveness of implementing various socio-economic welfare programs. Right? You have to provide better social security to your people, provide better education, strengthen your public health infrastructure. So India is lagging behind on these counts. Our public health care spending is a very small fraction of our GDP. What we spend, the, uh, the budget on education, is again a very small fraction of our GDP. These are key areas which need to be addressed and it cannot be done without focus on governance. Right? And for that you need strong democratic institutions. Next, of course, is the economic policies, the monetary policies of the government and the central bank. This has to push India towards transforming its infrastructure. Right now, the government has laid down a target to make India a $5 trillion economy. Right? The government has very grand ambitions to boost India's exports and imports. The government has put in place schemes like Atmanirbhar Bharat to make India more self-reliant, to reduce its dependency, import dependency on other countries. Right? So India wants to address the trade deficit it has. The government has put in action plans and schemes to boost our foreign trade, reduce our imports and to make our country self-reliant or, or more independent. Right? Initiatives like Make in India, they have definitely promoted indigenous production, indigenous development of key technologies, key processes. Right? But to take this forward, to continue on this path, you need state-of-the-art infrastructure. This is where India faces a very big challenge, a very big roadblock. Right? You would need better connectivity, better transportation. The country would need a much better digital infrastructure, mobile and internet connectivity, which has become the backbone of any economy today. Right? For example, take a look at uh, India's rollout of 5G networks. We are still lagging behind compared to other countries. Right? So these are certain key measures that India has to uh, take. Infrastructure related measures, both physical and, and digital infrastructure, both would be very crucial. This would not just include large public infrastructure projects like highways, ports, airports, etc. Right? The focus is not just on industrial clusters and special economic zones, but the focus should also be on the rural infrastructure. The focus should be on the agrarian economy as well, along with focusing on our industries. Right? There should be adequate attention given to our MSME sector. These are critical areas of our economy and they cannot be neglected. You can't just blindly go behind large industries. You can't simply put your faith in special economic zones and state-of-the-art infrastructure. Yes, they are needed. They would become the, the backbone of the economy, but you have to focus on other critical areas. Even today, 60% of our people are dependent on agriculture for a livelihood. Right? A large part of our economy is still dependent on the rural agrarian economy, which is facing so many challenges. When it comes to industrial development, MSMEs, they deserve maximum attention, which governments are providing, but we need to scale up the, the focus on MSME sector. Right? Because MSMEs, again, generate millions of jobs. They are critical for large employment. They constitute a very significant component of our exports. So focusing on the right areas, creating the right infrastructure is going to be absolutely critical and this will help India create the millions of jobs that are needed to improve the standard of living of our people. Right? Without providing jobs, without improving incomes, without providing basic education and health care, India cannot hope to become a developed nation by 2047. So these are some key areas of governance and administration that deserves focus from both the central government and the state governments. Right? And citizens also have a very big role to play here. The citizens can also contribute. Right? They can assist the government in implementation of schemes. The civil society, the NGOs can play a critical role here in better delivery of services. The citizens can Become a very active component of national progress by getting yourself better education, by contributing to the economy, by involving in research and development. Right? There are many ways through which you can contribute to India's national progress. So all of this should be accompanied with a parallel rise 
in India's diplomatic and military influence. And this requires a modernization of our diplomatic outlook. We would need new philosophies to drive Indian diplomacy. We need a new outlook towards the global geopolitics. We would need stronger armed forces to deal with all the emergent hybrid threats. Right? So there should be more focus on defense indigenization as well. That will parallelly drive the economy as well. And of course, science and technology, innovation, research and development. That would be a critical area because technology has always been a great leveler. It always levels the, the divides, cuts the divide and provides equal opportunity even for the disadvantaged classes. That is the power of technology. Look at how internet has truly democratized the economy today. Right? Anybody with a phone with a basic internet connection can create a successful livelihood without having to depend on the government or the private industry. Right? So technology can be a great leveler. So research and development, innovation, Indian startups, startups in every sector, they'll pay, play a critical role in the coming decades and this is what the government has to nurture. This task of making India a developed nation by 2047, it cannot be achieved by the government alone. Yes, a lot of effort comes from the government with regard to service delivery, governance, administration, all those efforts come from the government. But apart from that, the industry, the institutions, the scientific institutions and the people in general and the civil society. They all have a big role to play and it's on this basis that the Prime Minister has given a call for India and Indians to take up these resolutions and strive towards achieving this ambitious goal of turning India into a developed nation by 2047. So on this note, I would like to end my discussion. This topic can be very important for mains. You can get a, a descriptive question. Uh, in either in an economy or maybe even in polity and governance or even in ethics or even in social issues and social justice, right? You can even expect an entire essay topic on, on, on this particular issue. So with this, I would like to bring my discussion to an end. I hope the session has been beneficial. So if you liked it, do let us know by sharing your comments in the description box below. Do press the like button as well and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it for today. Thanks for watching.